historian from the University of Hartford, and I'm your moderator for the evening. This panel was precipitated through the inspiration of May Stevens. It was materialized as a result of a grant from the Connecticut Commission on the Arts, funds from the Connecticut, Connecticut Women Artists Incorporated, from the Friends of the Humanities and the Fine Arts Department of Manchester Community College, from the College of Arts and Sciences of the University of Hartford, through a grant from the Elizabeth Firestone Foundation, and in collaboration with the staff of Real Artways. That was quite a feat, actually. I would personally like to thank the numerous people from all of those institutions who have worked toward the realization of this event, particularly Suzanne Howes-Stevens of Manchester Community College, who procured this space for us and who expended tremendous energy in organizing support and publicity. At this very moment in Greater Hartford, there are exhibitions of the work of May Stevens and Jane Gilmore at Real Artways, Catherine Myers in the New Space Gallery right next door, Margaret Roll Rosati at Artworks, Bear Bell Shiangetti and Kathy Kalin at MS Gallery, Deborah Frizel at Hartford College for Women, and Ann Williams at the University of Connecticut at Storrs. It is a supposition of this panel that women's art deserves recognition, and that the recognition should come in the form of public assessment and analysis. This is important not only because art made by women has added significantly to the repertoire of art, but some, that considered feminist in particular, has in fact changed that repertoire, and it continues to do so. It has changed it in terms of form, content, media, and process, and in terms of ideological reference. <laughs> <laughs> the criteria used to judge feminist art has necessarily changed as well. Today, the debates of critical theory that swirl ar around both consciously feminist art and women's art in general is nearly as stimulating as the art itself. It is our intention to bring aspects of that debate to you this evening with presentations by critic Elizabeth Hess, art historian Patricia Hills, and artists Ellen Carey, Jane Gilmore, and Mae Stevens. During their presentations, you will have time to compile ideas and compare points of view, perhaps situating your own perspective somewhere on the continuum that I think will be established. Afterwards, there will be time for questions from the audience and interchange among the panelists. I would like to, be to begin the evening with a very brief overview, and that's hard for me, <laughs> of the directions of feminist art in the past two decades. For a much more complete assessment of the period, I would like to refer you to an article by Thalia Guma Peterson and Patricia Matthews entitled The Feminist Critique of Art in the September 1987 Art Bulletin, which has very adeptly, I'll give that again afterwards <laughs> if anybody wants it, this has very adeptly brought into focus many of the issues that have been of concern to women who have identified with the feminist art movement. This movement evolved out of the political activity and the feminist writings of the 1960s. At its inception, many women artists reacted with sheer anger against the lack of recognition given to women by the art establishment. Consciousness raising, which meant talking together about these issues, talking together about being women, brought about a feeling of community among small groups throughout the country. And from such support emerged communal and individual attempts to determine a new sensibility appropriate to women. At the heart of feminist art in the 1970s was a firm belief that art as activity and as image could empower a female consciousness. On the East Coast, groups of, of artists formed, often for the purpose of putting pressure on the art establishment to cease discrimination. Their goal was economic parity. On the West Coast, much further away from powerful art centers, women's artist groups more frequently chose to explore the female consciousness and to develop a corresponding visual aesthetic. Issues in early feminist art emerged in several general categories. And could I have the lights and the first slide, please? 
patriarchal oppression in the form of racism, sexism, and suppression of working classes was the focus of such work as Mae Stevens' Big Daddy series, an example of which you see here, or Nancy Sparrow's Codex Arto. Given a consciousness of that oppression, a simple review of the history of Western art quickly revealed not only that women suffered discrimination as artists, but that much of that discrimination was based on carefully constructed attitudes about the female nature and the appropriate demeanor and functions of the female body. This body, this is not by a female artist, this body has been the foremost image in painting and sculpture for four centuries of production, created for purchase by a male public and manipulated to an aesthetic of availability and pleasure for that public. This is a 19th century academic work by Cabanel. Several women artists began to react against this kind of control. Firstly, by showing its absurdity, as in this example by Sylvia Slee called the Turkish bath, in which, <laughs> in which the passivity, the languid quality, and the inviting characteristics of the female nude are transferred to the male form. <laughs> or by, showing, by using the artist's own body as a mode of making the exploitation of women's bodies apparent. This is a work uh, by Hannah Wilkie. It's one of 20 gestures from her series called Super Tart. And it has beneath it a quotation from Karl Marx. <laughs> or by finding a perspective on the female form that could only be that of a female, as in this painting by Joan Semmel called Me Without Mirrors. or exposing patriarchal control over women's sexuality by breaking the taboo of creating images of the vagina, this is the Sappho plate from Judy Chicago's dinner party, and evolving it into an image with positive aesthetic appeal. Degradation of women was found not only in relationship to the body, but to, to the traditions of creativity in which women participated, specifically those art forms still often categorized as crafts. Textiles, in particular, provided a rich source of tradition to be recuperated and glorified by such artists as Miriam Shapiro. This is a work from 1973 called Fragments from History or Harmony Hammond, this is a work from 79 called Hooker Time, and of course, Judy Chicago, this is a view of the setting for Artemisia Gentileschi from the dinner party. Research into female history was a necessary aspect of the early women's movement. Archives into which men normally didn't look revealed great numbers of women as participants in significant events in history and art history. Judy Chicago again. Paying homage to our female forerunners was the purpose of the dinner party, but also of works such as Miriam Shapiro's collaboration sh series. This is an example from 1976 of a collaboration with Mary Cassatt, or the Sister Chapel, and here we have one panel from that chapel created by um, Mae Stevens in homage to Artemisia Gentileschi. As an offshoot of this research, there quickly emerged an intense exploration of the mythic archetypes of women, images that could empower the spiritual and psychological identity of the female. Mary Beth Edelson visited Neolithic sites of goddess-worshipping cultures and enacted rituals in them, reinvigorating forgotten spirits and forgotten aspects of female strength. Betsy Damon's 7,000-year-old woman reinvoked the magical rites of women's power in ancient times in the midst of a busy New York street. Anna Mendieta's silhouette uh, figures evoke the female principle directly in the earth itself. 
As positive as the celebration of women's historical and spiritual heritage has been, other artists have seen a fundamental fallacy within it. The fallacy is inherent in the binary opposition of the masculine and the feminine, which, given our long tradition of patriarchy, inevitably, on a broad cultural level, relegates the feminine to the realm of, to use Simone de Beauvoir's phrase, the other. The other is always the lesser, no matter how fully celebrated. Furthermore, the celebration of the feminine, an approach now categorized as essentialist, is for some women no more liberating than its negation by the patriarchy has been. Not all women feel more closely connected with nature, with their bodies, with the emotive and intuitive aspects of life that the essentialists glorify. Thus, several American feminist artists of the 1980s, following a lead provided by British feminists, have chosen to analyze the cultural category of the feminine. Their analyses have come from theories of economics, psychoanalysis, semiotics, and others concerned with culture in general rather than with either art or women in particular. Their emphasis has been on loosening the category of the feminine, attempting to show it as a concept in the process of change, changing as the ideologies of our culture change. This brand of feminism, which we hesitatingly call postmodern or deconstructionist, insists that concepts of essence or truth are always the result of cultural ideology. And to the extent that we can understand how ideology works, how institutions operate, and how images produce meaning for their viewers, we can dismantle the ideologies that have suppressed women for so long. A good example of the difference between essentialist and postmodern feminist art is provided by comparing Judy Chicago's Birth Project and British artist Mary Kelly's postpartum document, a comparison that I borrow from Guma Peterson's and Matthew's article. Chicago's images in this project, of which you have one here, uh, this is one finished in needlework by Joe Chester, Joyce Gilbert, Joan Hargis, Peggy Patton, Carol Strittmatter, Karen Telfer, and Alvina Vaughn. It's a problem with dealing with collaborative works. Uh, <laughs> is physical to the point of being visceral, glorifying the primal heroic action of women resulting from the bodily function of giving birth. Mary Kelly's postpartum document, first exhibited in 1976, is a work of six series of documentary panels that record various aspects of the artist's day-to-day -day involvement with the growth of her son. The work contains objects and records of her infant's physical existence and written documentation with a Freudian analysis presented separately, giving commentary on the artist mother's interaction with her child vis-a-vis -vis this factual information. The first series, of which you see one panel here in a poor black and white slide, contained a now famous display of nappy liners juxtaposing fecal stains and feeding charts with commentary on the mother's anxiety. The third series presented markings made by her son at the age of two. A metaphorical diagram and diary notations are superimposed on the markings. The diary entries are based on conversations recorded at weekly intervals during the child's first three months in nursery school. Each conversation was played back later the same day and again the following week, the artist adding notations with each playing. Kelly uses the art object to implicate the unconscious operations that underlie it. The documents constitute a discourse which stands as a representation of her lived experience as a mother. The diagrams and notes are another discourse representing her simultaneous feminist analysis of that experience. Both are socially constructed aspects of her womanhood. In America, Barbara Kruger's work has effectively applied this deconstructive approach to a variety of cultural institutions 
by intermixing photographic images from magazines with straight or altered popular aphorisms. This work, shown at the Matrix Gallery two years ago, combines feminist defiance of the economic power structure with an implied questioning of the institution of love itself. And for those of you who can't read it, it says, money can buy you love. Typical of second generation or postmodernist feminism is, an ana is analyses of cultural assumptions of the masculine as well as the feminine, as in this work again by Kruger, which connects greatness with capitalist economics. It says you make history when you do business. Jenny Holzer's truisms take this critique one step further in reduction to ideology posited in language alone. Indicative statements with the ring of eternal truths were juxtaposed in lists in such a way that one truth denied the next. The lists were then printed and pasted in public settings. Uh, in public settings, pardon me, let me read a couple of these. Power should come as no surprise. Alienation can produce eccentrics or revolutionaries. An elite is inevitable. Anger or hate can be a useful motivating force, etc. <clears throat> Transferred to the spectator board in Times Square, as they were in 1982, the cultural critique of Holzer's work found an arena of presentation appropriate to the intensity of the attack. Postmodernist feminism has received positive critical acclaim in recent years from feminist and mainstream critics alike. This has been credited to its complex theoretical bases, which, in their intellectualism, have been seen by some essentialists as catering to the masculine establishment. To the same extent that some women feel disattached from essentialist positings of truth, others feel unaffected by the emotional distance of postmodernist feminism and isolated from or intimidated by the critical discourse that it has inspired. Ironically, feminist art is seen at present by criticism as vying between two camps. Thus, the same binary opposition that structures gender differentiation into the unequal entities called masculine and feminine now splits the feminist opposition. Tonight, three artists, a feminist critic and a feminist art historian, are assembled to provide further perspective on this situation. It is my opinion that there are few artists who are at the extremes of essentialism or of postmodernism. Extremes, however, still merit the acclaim of a critical establishment that revers the new and the defiant. The challenge today, I think, for feminist artists and for women artists in general, is to negotiate the middle ground. This can only be effective if it is elucidated with sufficient clarity and consciousness that the myriad of changes necessarily resulting from the fact of women's participation in the production of art will be noted in both their diversity and in their matrices. Such recognition is, I think, possible, but requires a cognizance of the complexities of the task and of the multifold ramifications that such visualizations portend for our goals and our desires within the institution of the art world and of culture at large. Investigating these complexities is the purpose of this evening's panel, so let us proceed. And could I have the lights on again, please? Okay. Our first speaker is Elizabeth Hess, who writes regularly on art for the Village Voice and the New York Observer. Other of her articles have appeared in Art in America, Art News, The Washington Post, Ms. Magazine, and Mother Jones. She's the co-author of the book Remaking Love, The Feminization of Sex, and has contributed an essay to a recently published anthology entitled Unwinding the War. She's now writing a book with Lucy Lepard and Harmony Hammond on contemporary women's art, which will be published soon by Pantheon Press. I give you Elizabeth Hess. Okay, thanks, thanks to Sherry. Um, this should make some sense, I hope. <laughs> she took the hard part of explaining the issues. 
<clears throat> How's that? Can you hear? Okay. No slides, I'm afraid. You have to look at me. <laughs> <clears throat> Whether you live in New York or not, artists, along with everyone else, understand that talking about art is equivalent to talking about stocks and bonds, with one not notable exception. At the moment, art is a better investment. A lot has happened over the past two decades which has affected the way we think about art and the art that is being produced. There you have it in a nutshell. Artists don't make art anymore, they produce it. And much of this contemporary work falls under the rubric of deconstruction. Looking back at women's art prior to this period is like backing through the looking glass into a world that was much less encumbered by the value of art. As we approach the 90s, the 60s and the 70s feel distant. Remember the days when it was fun to be a feminist? Remember when we all looked forward to going to meetings? Today I'm afraid the terms of endearment for the women's movement have changed. In 1970, I went to my first official women's liberation meeting. I didn't really know what to expect, but I had a sense that I needed to be liberated. I knew who the enemy was, men, that was easy, but I didn't know how to live with them or without them. The amazing thing to me at 18 years old was that no one else did either. But together, women discovered a pool of experience in their own backyards, most of which was entirely untapped. We were explorers with, with a sense that our mission would change the world. Quickly we learned that only by organizing could we have any degree of power. The thing that really distinguishes the good old stage one days, uh, stage one I guess refers to the essentialism, um, was that politics in the art world and outside of it were connected, and equally important, political activity in general was exhilarating. Even the fights were inspiring. There was a loose consensus during this so-called essentialist period that we were all in this revolution together. Together was the operative word. The reason that I'm attempting, attempting to describe the atmosphere during the early women's art movement is that it was dramatically different from the present situation. Many women, in particular artists, were attracted to feminism like bees to honey. The atmosphere wasn't always sweet, but the possibility of transformation, whatever shape it took, was intoxicating. Today, I think that for some women, particularly younger women, feminism is not as key to their agendas or their art. In 1988, is feminism motivation enough to organize? What are the rewards? In retrospect, many women have said that their reasons for joining the movement were personal. Hence, the old saw, which can still cut, the personal is political. At the beginning, everyone talked about sex. At first, quite personally, although eventually quite theoretically. Intercourse, a heterosexual term now stricken from most vocabularies, <laughs> became a metaphor for <laughs> the subjugation, also not a term used much anymore, of women. En masse, we came to the conclusion that the phallus was as obsolete as a tonsil. It simply <laughs> got in the way. Vaginal imagery ruled as women recreated female sexuality in their own image. The battle between the sexes was launched. Today this battle continues, but we are also faced with battles within our own movement. Today we rarely talk about sex, now we talk about gender. The sexual revolution which began in the 60s was virtually smothered by the 80s. Phyllis Schlafly and members of the New Right reclaimed the issue for themselves as they wiped the ERA off our constitutional agenda. Fundamentalists began turning birth control clinics into chastity centers. Abortion clinics were bombed. From Schlafly's perspective, AIDS is a ready-made crisis that meets her ideological needs. Two decades ago, sex and even the family were our issues. The so-called experts were exposed as quacks and women began to speak for themselves. Today, the conservative forces that proliferate understand as well as we do that if women are allowed to control sex, Next, we'll take over the economy, the courts, the military, where already women are agitating to fight on the front lines and eventually move into the White House. The meaning of sex is no longer understood by how it is practiced. Anybody, whatever their sexual proclivities, can turn on Phil Donahue, buy a magazine or read a book and figure out exactly how to have explosive orgasms. 
Sex has been reinterpreted as a, as a complex negotiation mediated by those who govern our social, economic, and political lives. These days, sex requires thought prior to action. We have arrived at stage two. Sex has turned into gender. You may be wondering what all this has to do with art. So am I. I feel very strongly that feminist art must be viewed within the context of the movement that inspired it. If we are going to understand the distinctions between essentialism and deconstruction and why they rub each other the wrong way, it is productive to ask, how did women during stage one make these, I mean, why did women during stage one make these particular kinds of essentialist images? Why did women become feminists at all? In retrospect, we can consider whether the work looks good or bad, was self-indulgent or universal. But more important, it is significant that the essentialist 70s were enormously productive for thousands of women artists. The body of work, so to speak, is huge, and it tells an important story. Today, in comparison, we should be asking, how productive is the current deconstructionist atmosphere for feminist artists? And we should consider the visibility of feminism as we know it in contemporary art. In other words, is deconstructionist work motivated by feminism? The jury is still out. Obviously, the project of feminism has become more complex over the last two decades for all of us. No one ever dreamed that the Reagan administration could make Carter look good, or that an Ollie North could be created to make Richard Nixon look like a petty criminal. North is indicted the day we send troops to Honduras for a border war that both countries agree doesn't exist. If the U.S. wants a war and says there's a war, this is the reality we are asked to believe. It's called progress in the technological age of information, and when faced with the consequences of U.S. imperialism, many artists, who are the visionaries of our future, have had to develop a critical, if not cynical, imagination. Many feminist critics have learned to identify more with artists than their own peers. Lucy Lepard, for instance, abandoned the mainstream to, to struggle from inside the women's art movement to create a language able to articulate a new vision of the female self. Many people in this audience will, will remember debates over the feminist aesthetic or female-centered imagery. As feminists became more powerful and more articulate, the rank and file in the movement began to divide. In the early 80s, sex once again was, an, was the issue, but this time it was associated with violence. While some of us argued that the dominant representations of the female body offered a reading of a constructed sexuality that was more about fantasy and repression than reality, others went on a crusade to censor those images which they judged detrimental to our health. While women against pornography became more and more literal, other feminists began to wander through the psychological terrain of desire and repression. The debate over pornography was significant for women artists because it was a debate over the interpretation of images. It was not simply a small discussion among feminists, but a public argument that even reached the courts. It is at this point that the discourse of the feminist movement at large began to focus on the control and interpretation of images. The porn debate has died down, thank God, but a degree of bitterness lingers. One of the big differences between the 70s and the late 80s, or stage one and stage two, is that there is no longer a shared assumption that we are all united, whether we call ourselves essentialists, deconstructionists, goddesses, or atheists. Can the fact that feminists, no, no, can the fact that feminists are no longer aligned with each other, or even at times are diametrically opposed to each other, inform our movement, make it more inclusive and less exclusive? There is general agreement over certain limitations. The women's movement, for instance, has always had a better grip on sex than race or class, which has affected our ability to move forward. We are also faced with the fact that feminism is now continually invoked at the service of the right wing, which co-ops our language and our strategies to recruit women over to the other side. Several years ago, at a Right to Life demonstration in D.C., I saw vivid posters of fetal imagery that could just as easily have been generated by Judy Chicago's birth project. I know why I call myself a feminist, but I find myself confronted more and more by women activists whose politics I don't share. I guess the obvious point is that the women's art movement has matured. There are now a number of important art historians and critics, and a large body of work about which we are no longer constrained to agree. 
It used to feel like we were writing primarily for each other, almost creating a separatist art history. Yet what was always painfully obvious to us is finally penetrating into the mainstream. The work is not only innovative by our own standards, but theirs. The influence of early feminist artists is evident. Many of them are now players in a market they once strove to destroy. The advent of the 90s makes me think more about the 60s. Sometimes I long for the days when the women's movement was the women's liberation movement, the days when we spoke about sex rather than gender. My cynical side says sex has been relegated to something we are not supposed to do anymore, replaced by gender, which is something outside of us that we have become or have the option to become or are supposed to be. In some ways, the concept of gender opens up issues. Sex is hot and gender is cold. It's neutral, a mirror which can reflect images back rather than absorb them. The liberation in gender is its lack of baggage. Sex is a reality, a practice, while gender is an abstraction, a theory. Yet we have all come to understand, the hard way, that sex without theory is a practice which gets us into a lot of trouble. I was asked to speak about the debate between the essentialists and the deconstructionists. At the risk of sounding like a wimpy centrist, it seems to me that these two movements need each other. Choosing one side or the other feels like a, like a setup, as ridiculous as spending time distinguishing between the Democrats and the Republicans. Once they get into office, for the most part, they are the same. One registers to vote for a principle, but party politics are a ruse. Moreover, the women's art movement isn't exactly a two-party system. Still, I find the delineation between the essentialists and the deconstructionists useful, particularly when it comes to understanding our own progress. May Stevens recently asked me if I realized that she was an essentialist, or rather, that she was thought of as an essentialist. While her work has always been essential, I wasn't sure about the ist. <laughs> Is it good or bad to be an essentialist, I wondered. Well, for one thing, it's not very postmodern, the kiss of death in the current art world. Mira Shore, the editor of a new journal called Meaning, recently commented that the term essentialism is a nomenclature given to a movement by those who wish to put it down, by, by deconstructionists who consider early feminist work to be primitive. There's already an unspoken sense that the essentialists are the losers, the underdogs. The assumption is that they have less power, visibility, and dare I say it, intelligence. As a feminist, it's the kind of profile that makes me want to join them to fight this nonsense, except that I think it's a silly battle. Guma Peterson and Matthews have done us all a service by giving us an opinionated short history of our own movement. Their article, by their own admission, is not complete, but it's rich with ideas and structures which have already launched a healthy discussion on feminist art. In theory, the so-called deconstructionists, and I have no idea how the artists themselves feel about these labels, offer us all a window. To generalize their perspective for a moment, few people would disagree with the notion that what we see is mediated by what we have been taught to look at. Likewise, what artists make, think, and even eat is constructed by myriad social forces, including feminism. I've always felt that fringe movements are probably the most interesting places to be if you get there in time. But the mainstream isn't exactly dull. The strange thing about the deconstructionists is that they are not on the fringe, whereas many essentialists have always been on the outside looking in. Women artists these days are glamorous. Every gallery needs a few. I consider this a victory, although the terrain is a minefield. In general, artists with disdain for success rarely have any. I'm glad that feminist artists are debating the politics of success rather than failure. But it is important to ask why this, where this so-called deconstructionist work that we are seeing in the gallery stands, particularly on the issue of feminism. Depending on my mood, I could argue that Mae Stevens is an essentialist or that she is a deconstructionist. From an essentialist point of view, Stevens has focused on the figure, her mother, as the primal subject. She has also resurrected Rosa Luxemburg from the dungeon of history and put her forth as a role model. Both figures are united biologically by the fact of their femaleness, which is the location of their oppression. On the other hand, in her recent, recent show at the New Museum, technology, rather than paint, plays a major role in revealing, primarily by altering, her archival images. Her mother has been kicked out of the frame altogether, and in one piece, Stevens cuts Luxembourg's figure out of a photo and then puts her altered image back in again. Rosa is getting the ax, so to speak, like Alice, because her absence is now understood as a presence. 
Now Stevens has moved out into the locale of Luxembourg's politic by using the Internationale as her frame of reference, rather than the feminist project of revisionist portraiture. These pieces distinguish themselves from Stevens' paintings beyond the fact that they are huge photographic poster-like prints. The portraits are ghoulish, unrecognizable, far from flattering, and are primarily of men. It's as if she deconstructs the history of her own work. Technology is in the forefront painting these new magnetic portraits by obscuring faces, facts, and details. Stevens goes even further by bracketing her images with a text hung on the wall in proximity to the pictures. She now gives the viewer a context, a reading of the events behind the images, insisting on the primacy of her own interpretation. She inserts this reality into the murky, seductive pictorial vision that is of her own making, linking the text to the pictures like an invisible anchor to a floating ship. Her analytic poetic texts acknowledge the fluidity of interpretation. For Stevens, of course, the image remains a metaphor for feminism and for history, but now her images and her metaphors are the locus of a struggle over their own interpretation. Stevens literalizes the notion that regardless of how powerful her portraits are, they are simultaneously texts which await our projections. This show also moves away from paint, which implicitly puts it in the deconstructionist camp. Perhaps this means that Stevens is a crossover artist, formally linking the concerns of early feminists with those of the new postmodernists. Maybe Stevens is a post-essentialist. <laughs> While I'm not sure that the crux of the argument between the essentialists and the deconstructionists is over the representation of the body, it certainly has become the issue. Feminist artists have spent a long time coming to terms with the female body, loving it, hating it, dressing it, stripping it, impregnating it, aborting it, exploring its every lumps and bumps. The deconstructionists are foolish if they are suggesting that the subject is exhausted. Our bodies remain endlessly fascinating to everyone, for better or worse but our bodies are not changing as rapidly as the world in which they breathe. In fact, the body doesn't change, our perceptions of it do. Gender can even be biologically altered, and life can begin in a test tube. I suspect, uh, regardless, I suspect that many essentialists, rightly so, resent the presumption that stage one is over. The hierarchical view of these ideological stages stacked upon one another is misguided. I am not arguing to throw the body out with the bathwater, as Lucy Lepard recently wrote in an article soon to be published in Heresies, but that to propel our understanding of what gender is, its creation and ongoing progress, it is certainly valid to consider the image of femaleness apart from the body, which has its own reality, one that is as real or as constructed as the war in Central America. Think of it this way. We are all voyeurs gazing at the female body in the bathwater. Women and men alike might choose to gaze at the figure, but women alone can see and articulate the expressly female experience of our bodies in the water. For men, this may not be an uninteresting project, but it is one that exists in the realm of fantasy. On the other hand, women or men could choose not to look at the body, but to go down the drain themselves, through the pipes, through the sewers, to the reservoir at the source of the supply. How will gender affect this trip? It is a reservoir filled with toxic yet thirst-quenching images, facts and fictions, some of which are barely dis distinguishable from each other, the mechanics of which need to be deconstructed, for lack of any better word. What we need to discern is whether or not this new path is rooted in a feminist vision. If it's not, it can't possibly take an activist position on the question of social change for us all. Thank you. The lights were up for that one, so you could all take notes. A lot of, a lot of good thoughts for taking notes on. Our next speaker is Jane Gilmore. Jane Gilmore's work is now being exhibited in Real Artways. Jane is a multimedia sculptor and a professor of art at Mount Mercy College in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. She is represented by AIR Gallery in New York City and has recently exhibited there and at Bernice Steinbaum Galleries. Name Gallery in Chicago, Palazzo Vagnotti in Cortona, Italy, and the Minnesota Museum of Art, and Florida State University Museum in Tallahassee. 
She has received a National Endowment Regional Arts Fellowship and numerous awards for her work in the past 10 years of exhibitions. <coughs> her shrines and installations combine metal relief with video, film, and photo documents of her performances and tableau works in New York, Iowa, Greece, Italy, Egypt, and Japan. I give to you Jane Gilmore. Uh, in anticipating this presentation, I, I thought about two things. One, that I'm the, the only artist uh, from outside an urban art center, way outside <laughs> from the Midwest. And also, I, I assumed that uh, the deconstructivist or the sort of postmodern approach to the discussion of women's representation in culture uh, would, be fairly, would be well represented by other panelists. Uh, in my own work, I am concerned with both the construction and the deconstruction of myths about women or about gender. And though usually my work is interpreted as a parody of traditional representations of women, I still feel linked to some of the so-called essentialist uh, goddess archetypal images. So what I've chosen to do is to discuss my work in terms of issues that were introduced to me by many of the so-called essentialists uh, early feminists who visited the University of Iowa, where I was a graduate student, in the early and mid-1970s. In my opinion, uh, these early feminist artists, and critics, and historians uh, contributed significantly to this current critique of the cultural construction of the meaning of woman or of gender. One of my first introductions, by the way, to these issues was in a course that I took on women artists by Sherry Buckborough at the University of Iowa. Uh, other visitors to the campus during the early mid-70s included, uh, included Judy Chicago, Miriam Shapiro, uh, Lucy Lepard, Gloria Ornstein, uh, Mary Beth Edelson. Uh, so there was an exposure there, and I think it's, it, it's rather important that they came out and, and introduced us to these ideas. Uh, by investigating the experiences associated with being female, I think these feminists exposed myths at the same time that they celebrated powerful images of women. Uh, let's uh, show the first slide. Um, <laughs> One of the key issues they introduced to me was content. Uh, in other words, women's experiences, uh, social, biological, political, uh, whether culturally defined or not, were different than those of men. And for that reason, and for their art to be genuine, it must at least be allowed to come from those experiences. So by 1975, my art, I had been in textiles and painting, had evolved into making clothes for my cat <laughs> that, um, <laughs> questioned or mocked stereotypes associated with being female. In 1976, I entered uh, photos of my cat, Miss Kitty Glitter, in a national competition called the All-American Glamour Kitty Contest, uh, which was sponsored by a kitty litter manufacturer. Well, to my amazement, out of 25,000 contestants in the country, most of whom I'm afraid were probably children wanting to win this. Um, my cat <laughs> was one of nine uh, to win a trip to Miami Beach for the week of the final competition. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we were greeted at the airport by the mayor of Miami Beach and Miss Miami Beach, who presented us with the key to the city uh, and a mouse-mobile motorcade, uh, <laughs> which took us to the Hotel Fontainebleau, <laughs> where the final competition was held. Uh, <laughs> I used photographs and video, uh, among other things, to document events like this performance of the Dancing Mouse Girls, uh, which was done on Coronation Night. <laughs> uh, the week-long contest, by the way, was also uh, covered by CBS News. <laughs> <laughs> now, later, uh, uh, several months later, I created an installation based on this experience, and, uh, but by putting the artifacts uh, in the context of the gallery, I sort of enshrined them. They be became like icons. In fact, this early sculpture, also from 77, 
uh, shows the point at which the real cat disappears from my work. But the image associating woman with cat uh, is significant for the way it, in which it evolves into something uh, quite different later. So that, that's why I show it now. Now, on a, a little more serious note, um, th this first series of works that I did, I think owes a lot to the women I met and studied with at Iowa. They introduced me to the idea, first of all, of using art as a vehicle for political comment or social change. Mary Beth Edelson was especially important in this respect, I think. Uh, she, as Sherry pointed out in showing her work, uh, she visited Iowa and created installations similar to this one, which is actually at AIR, but she did one in Iowa. This is a memorial to nine million women burned as witches in the Christian era from 1977. The gateway shows women's hands making the sign of the bullhorns that are associated with the ancient Minoan snake goddess. The installation also included group ritual, uh, and this took place inside and outside the gallery on Halloween. Mary Beth introduced us also, uh, along with others, to the use of ritual as a new form in dealing with this new content. In fact, this was just one of several important new forms that were introduced to us, including uh, the use of performance, tableau, multimedia uh, installations where one might use video, uh, and also to new approaches, collaborative, cooperative approaches, group approaches. The women's art movement also introduced me to issues of origin and lost history. I think Sherry noted their reevaluation of the woman as subject and rediscovery of women artists of the past. But this, this poppy goddess, which uh, is from uh, 1100, 1400 BC Crete, with raised arms, uh, is from ancient Crete. And this particular gesture is an example of an image that was appropriated by some feminist artists from a past culture that symbolized the female as a powerful force and a unifier of, of mind and body or spirit and ma matter. This, uh, another Minoan snake goddess, uh, also has raised arms and is clasping two snakes and has a cat on her head. Uh, the face of this artifact is especially aggressive and almost mask-like to me. Now, this, this archetypal gesture then of, of the Minoan goddess becomes almost a political symbol for the female principle as a strong creative force. Uh, this photo collage, also by Mary Beth Edelson, is an example of how this gesture appears repeatedly in the feminist art, particularly that I think that we were exposed to at Iowa in the 70s. Anna Mendieta was a graduate student with me in multimedia at the University of Iowa, and uh, when Mary Beth Edelson visited. Uh, this is an earth body work from her 1976 Silhouetta series. Anna consistently used, as, as uh, Sherry mentioned, this er earth goddess imagery, which seems also uh, to deal with resurrection, both in a personal and mythical sense and in a political sense. Anna was a native Cuban, but she was displaced to Iowa in the 60s. This image of her silhouette formed by firecrackers was done on a return trip to Latin soil in Mexico in 1976. Now this slide documents a performance of mine from 1976 that was done in a small mountain shrine in Crete. I think here you can see how that cat as woman image reappears as a mask figure in, in the works that I start to do in performance and tableau. During the next several years, from about 1977 on, <laughs> uh, I started taking students uh, from the school where I teach uh, on, on study trips to Greece and Turkey and the Middle East, and I began a series of collaborative, and I took some friends too, we began a series of collaborative performances and tableau pieces at ancient ruin sites, sort of reclaiming a history for ourselves. Um, these tableau both embraced and parodied the use of archetypal goddess imagery uh, in feminist art. Uh, this one's from 77. Uh, this one is at uh, Delphi and at the rotunda at the temple uh, of Athena Proni. And this is a place that I seem to return to every year for uh, or five or six years. This is the first one from 1978 to produce both independent and collaborative works. Uh, this performance is a detail of that performance. Juxtapose these long, still tableau with frantic gestures and dance. Uh, the, meta the, the movements were like metaphors for cycles of order and chaos, or birth and rebirth, uh, death, rather, death and rebirth. 
Now this particular uh, tableau image is from much later. It was done in Italy two years ago. Uh, but it resulted from my, uh, I, I sort of not worked with this kind of imagery in between for a few years, and I was in a small museum in, the, in, a, in a town where I was living in Italy, and in the museum I found a tiny little bronze goddess uh, figure, an Etruscan figure with a little duck on her head. And then I walked the same day into my new apartment, uh, or not new apartment, but uh, my apartment, <laughs> and, and on the table was this ancient stuffed duck and one other uh, stuffed bird. And it, so they reappeared in many of my pieces uh, in the last couple of years. When using live performers was impossible, I started using these photo dolls, which are about eight inches high. Uh, when I found, th this is from 1978 also, when I found this lion-headed goddess at the temple of Karnak in Luxor, I realized that I had really never, although I'd, I'd seen this Egyptian goddess image before, I'd really never consciously made the connection between my Catwoman images and this ancient Neftut goddess. <coughs> then years later, in fact, in uh, 1986, I found this statue in a cemetery in uh, Caserta <laughs> Palace Gardens uh, near Rome called Issues of Origin. <laughs> now, in spite of the fact that my work often parodies devotional art and ritual, I think images like this one, and I really hadn't thought about this until I started going through the slides, but uh, this one at the Temple of Apollo in Delphi, also from 1978, uh, demonstrate there's a still strong undercurrent in my work that connects me with this archetypal imagery. I do understand, however, uh, the danger that such images may also reinforce that nature-nurture syndrome, that, that so-called essentialist uh, linking of woman with nature but denying her uh, a role in constructing culture. In spite of that, I, I would agree with Lucy Lepard when she said that to, to reject all aspects of women's experience as dangerous stereotypes often means rejecting some of the more valuable aspects of our female identities. And though they might be used against us now, their final disappearance would serve the dominant culture all too well. A another good point Sherry made, I thought, was, uh, was that the women's art movement of the 70s was also responsible for a rediscovery of traditional women's culture, including folk arts, uh, so-called minor arts, textiles, and, uh, and out even outsider art. Uh, they pointed out that one of the the roles of female culture had always been to integrate art in life or to integrate nature and culture. So while I was in Greece, I, I kept seeing along the side of the roads these eccentric little roadside shrines, which were built, I found out later, as memorials to accident <coughs> victims. Inside the shrines would be photographs of the deceased and uh, religious icons, many times body parts, uh, the sh uh, icon body parts. <laughs> uh, the shrines were regularly tended with flowers and food, uh, candles, and usually by women. The ability of these so-called naives uh, or uh, <coughs> outsider artists to link or connect planes of existence, uh, the physical and the spiritual, uh, the rational and the, the intuitive is something that I admired greatly and, and ha has inspired me in my most recent work. This particular shrine in Italy was built for a child killed in a car accident uh, and the child's clothes were dyed a symbolic red and hung outside the shrine. Yeah. Discovering those roadside shrines then um, in the early 80s I prompted me to once again start combining my, my photo and video documents of performances with other materials to create more sculptures and installations, uh, like this one at Name Gallery, which is in 1984. Uh, these are just some examples of the sort of shrine-type pieces that incorporate documents of the performances, both uh, from, from different time periods. Uh, this is an early wall relief, it's about three feet high, uh, in which I use metal repoussé with uh, Polaroids and found objects. And this is a goddess altar piece uh, from 19, this is actually a very early one, uh, 82, and it attaches the actual photo dolls used in the photo tableaus to the piece. So this is a detail of uh, that bottom section. So those are about eight inches high. This is a goddess video shrine, uh, also an earlier piece. In this piece, there's a five-inch video monitor, and it shows two cat mask women 
motionless, sort of staring at the viewer, while this giant goddess in the shadows tap dances pretty clumsily, it's, it's me, uh, <laughs> on, on, the sti- on the steps of the Parthenon behind them. The soundtrack includes sections from the dating section of the Burlitz language tape. Before we would take the students to Greece, we would study the language tape and the dating section. The first question was, do you have a light? And the second one was, do you live alone? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, but those, those, I, I love those phrases and they sort of take on double meaning, like do you have a light being you know, sort of levels of recognition or, or awakening at the same time that, that of course, has that satirical <laughs> note. So. So that little uh, videotape is, is actually in the, in a similar one in the piece at Real Art Ways now. Uh, this piece is called It's a Long Way Down from 1986, and it uh, is about four feet high. In this one, I use sticks, which came from looking at, uh, uh, actually from a trip to Japan and looking at the shrines there. And on the sticks, I wrote about what was happening to me while I was doing the performances, but it also just turned into sort of a stream of consciousness writing. This piece entitled, Do You Live Alone, uh, has an interior tableau. It's, it's a small piece, it's about 18 inches high. Uh, this stuffed bird is the other bird that I found in my apartment in Italy on the table, um, being confronted by a tiny <coughs> toy soldier. Uh, one, a, a friend of mine, an art historian, recently reminded me that this, or, or said this reminded her of the 19th century uh, paintings of women holding dead birds, which she said was a symbol of a loss of innocence, connection that I had not thought of, but seems very interesting. Uh, in the last two years, I, I was fortunate enough to have a residency in, in Italy two years ago, and so I did a series of pieces, first based on, I had been visiting cemeteries in this country and, and there also, and so this series is based on those visits to the cemeteries. Uh, often in cemeteries there they use photographs. Uh, kind of uh, to construct uh, a past for the person. Um, these are pieces about five feet high. Uh, <coughs> this sculpture, Do You Have a Light, uses a video once again. It's about a five inch screen. Um, this was part of an installation at AIR. Uh, I started using more found objects in Italy because I ran out of other materials. I think that was a good thing. <laughs> Another view of the same piece. This one called More Modern Ruins. I began to find metal, uh, old parts of old pigeon houses that I used in with the other materials. Now, uh, one last point. Uh, even uh, even before I discovered these roadside shrines, I had found in my own backyard where I teach at Mount Mercy College, which had originally been a private Catholic girls' school, and now it's become a liberal arts for your. Um, school. Uh, on the campus, I had found this wonderful grotto, and this is a 1940s May Day pageant at the Our Lady of Sorrows Grotto, where I teach, uh, and I have since spent um, quite a bit of time researching the grottos of the Midwest and working on restoration of those sites. Uh, I also have used this site. This tableau was done at the grotto, and it introduces a new character in my work as of about 1985, um, Irma. She appears as sort of a tourist or a typical woman of the world, definitely not a postmodern woman. <laughs> um, she's constantly shadowed by the feline goddess, and uh, th- this tableau is entitled Irma Reconstructs Time and Religion. <laughs> this is Irma's apparition of her greatness. <laughs> My use of satire uh, is intended to ask the viewer to question the stereotypes presented in images like this one. Uh, This is Irma continues to deconstruct time, religion, and liberty. Uh, I think this this closing slide represents a synthesis of the issues raised in my work about the meaning of woman in our culture. I think myths are created throughout our lives by by day-to-day experiences and by the culture in which we live. And I'm most concerned, I guess, with the deeper relationships between myth and experience and between image and experience. But I think this interest is in the construction of myth is directly the result of my exposure to the ideas presented to me in the 70s at Iowa, like women like uh, Mary Beth Edelson, Sherry Buckborough, Anna Mendieta, Lucy Lepard, Gloria Ornstein. So I feel that these early feminists who did visit Iowa Iowa, contributed a significant foundation 
for this current critique of our cultural construction of the definition of woman. Francisco Museum of Art, the New Museum of Contemporary Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and numerous other major collections. She's received a Guggenheim Fellowship, an NEA grant, a NISCA award, and her work has been recognized internationally through attention in books and periodicals, considerable attention, by major American and British historians and critics. A significant exhibition of her work was recently held at Kenyon College in Ohio, and I just thought I'd mention that the fascinating catalog produced for that show is now on display and also at, uh, for sale at Real Artways. May Stevens. She didn't put down anything about essentialism and deconstructionism. I thought perhaps what I would try to say to you before I show you the slides, where hopefully some of those issues are dealt with, is that um, I have never actually been satisfied with any of these ideologies. I never felt myself to be totally at home with um, any of the categories, which I have been associated with and worked with and in and um, you know felt that I wanted to support uh, to a certain extent but there was always um, a feeling that it didn't fit I didn't fit quite which didn't prevent me from uh, trying to work within these kinds of um, subjects or areas uh, I think I began in a sense uh, by being in my work uh, extremely political that this was my first orientation. Uh, one of the reasons for that, I, I always have a sense, is that I come from um, New England, from Boston, and I think when one grows up there, there's a real sense of history. And I think that sense of history that I had also made me uh, in some way conscious of, of politics and the necessity of being aware of politics. So the, the first kind of art that I did that made, I think, a statement that was strongly my own was when I did the Big Daddy series, and you saw uh, the first slide of Sherry's was one of those Big Daddy images. So that was my one of my ways of showing a political uh, orientation. But it wasn't, it didn't satisfy me because I realized, as many of us who were in political cultural activities at the time, um, it was uh, without the presence of women. Our activities were without the presence of women except in subsidiary roles. And in my work, I was dealing with the presence of this man, this big daddy figure, which actually symbolized that uh, situation. So there was the lack of the presence of women and also, um, along with that, the lack of the presence of any kind of real sensual sense in my work and in the thinking and the activities that were going on that we were part of, there was not um, the kind of imagining and the kind of sensitivity and the kind of sensuality that I was later to find when I became an active feminist. So that in the joining, my joining of the feminist movement, I found a kind of politics that I could involve myself in and I found more imaginative, more sensitive, and more sensuous uh, relationships uh, among us that were very much part of what we were doing, not separate from, but um, very integrated into um, the feminist activities. However, <laughs> um, there was not, for me, 
um, the satisfaction that I needed in thinking that the things that I was doing within the feminist movement were strongly connected to an outside politics that I felt was continuously essential. And I was calling myself a socialist feminist at this time and for a long time and still do, trying to indicate that uh, socialism by itself isn't satisfactory uh, when it, it does not pay attention to these other elements and that feminism without a kind of socialist conscience is for me insufficient as well. So um, I was extremely interested when uh, I got to know Mary Kelly in England and uh, learned about her thinking and saw the postpartum document which Sherry also showed as it developed. And I found this to be very, very moving. The fact that this woman was documenting the life of her child um, using the kind of relics that women put into baby books and at the same time analyzing it through a very advanced psychoanalytical means seemed to me a marvelous way of trying to put together uh, trying to have it all, trying to put everything together. So I found that to be very stimulating and many of the ideas analyzing woman as a concept that was constructed by others for us in which we are no doubt complicit I found this extremely stimulating and I was um, very interested in reading this, these kinds of uh, ideas and getting to know these kinds of people. But I did end up feeling um, a great loss in the art of any kind of sensuous sensibility. It seemed to me after a while unbearably dry and the photo text became very limiting uh, in, for me in my feeling about the art that was being produced. I still very much respect that postpartum document that, um, that I'm referring to, but um, the photo text became, I think, a kind of bind for, um, for us, uh, for, well, it, it seemed to me very, very limiting. I don't think that that's true for all of the people who subscribe to a kind of um, deconstructive mode, but that is one aspect to it that um, bothered me a great deal. Before I start in with the slides, I um, would like to read two quotations which uh, have remained very important for me. They come from back a bit, but I think they're still very useful. The first is um, a Linda Nochlin quotation from the first article, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? And I, found, I find it still extremely important, and I copied it out today because I wanted to remind myself of it. She said in that article in 1970-71, a feminist critique of the discipline of art history is needed which can pierce cultural ideological limitations to reveal biases and inadequacies not merely in regard to the question of women artists, but in the formulation of the crucial questions of the discipline as a whole. Thus the so-called woman question can become a catalyst a potent intellectual instrument, probing the most basic and natural, in quotation, assumptions, providing a paradigm for other kinds of internal questioning, and providing links with paradigms established by radical approaches in other fields. I still feel very, very much that way, that the feminist approach enables us to connect with other radical approaches as well and also that it has to do with the, all the disciplines, all the culture, which we need uh, to analyze, so that it's not limited at all. And also, I do see feminism as an instrument for analysis, an instrument for understanding the world around us. And the other quote is from Adrian Rich, and I've quoted it many times, but I still find it, as I say, very important. Um, she says, the rejection of dualism of the positive-negative polarities between which most of our intellectual training has taken place has been an undercurrent of feminist thought. And rejecting them, we reaffirm the existence of all those who have, through the centuries, been negatively defined, not only women, but the untouchable, the unmanly, the non-white, the illiterate, the invisible, which forces us to confront the problem of the essential dichotomy power and powerlessness. So the reason I suppose both of those have uh, a great resonance for me still is because they <coughs> try, I think, to relate feminism to the rest of the world as well. And uh, for me, that's important. 
um, slides. I'm going to read the um, description of this artist's book, which some of you may know, um, but I want just to set up what it's about for those of you who, who perhaps don't, um, by reading a... something that I wrote to describe the artist's book, which came out in 1980. Ordinary Extraordinary, which is the name of the artist book and of the series that um, I've been doing for, well, since 1980 at least. A collage of words and images of Rosa Luxemburg, Polish German revolutionary leader and theoretician, murder victim, 19, uh, 1871 to 1919, juxtaposed with images and words of Alice Stevens, born 1895, housewife, mother, washer, and ironer, inmate of hospitals and nursing homes. A filmic sequence of darks and lights moving through close up to long view and back, oblique, direct, fragments of Rosa's thought from intimate notes sent from prison to her comrade and lover, Leo Jokic's, and to her friends, from Agitprop, published in De Rotafana, and from her serious scientific writings, images from her girlhood, her middle life, and the final photograph of her murdered head. Alice's words from the memory of and letters to her daughter, an artist's book examining and documenting the mark of a political woman and marking the life of a woman whose, other, whose life would otherwise be unmarked. Ordinary, extraordinary. This is the first collage that I did in the series, and it was a, an image in um, Heresies, the first issue of Heresies when it came out in 1977. And this was on the facing page of that first issue of Heresies. Uh, it's called Tribute to Rosa Luxemburg. It has the image of Rosa Luxemburg in the upper right. Um, the two small images, photographs uh, on the lower left, are Rosa's prison cell, and below that, the um, murderers of Rosa Luxemburg. The texts are um, Rosa wrote a secret letter from prison in urine on a page of French poetry. So uh, the very upper left has the French poetry. Underneath that is a letter in German written by Rosa Luxemburg. And then across the whole, I've written a translation of uh, some of her letters. From the artist's book, uh, a two-page facing page situation with Rosa as a young woman and Alice as a young woman. From the artist's book and the small collages that were the source of it, I went to doing um, paintings that were six and a half feet by 12 feet, uh, wanting them to be almost environmental and life-size and um, to feel as real as a movie feels. This is called um, Demonstration, and it represents a demonstration in Berlin in 1967 when uh, Berliners were celebrating the um, lives of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. The painting is done in iridescent <coughs> silver and pewter paint, which is uh, intended to evoke the span of time and um, the gray rainy day that it was and the wet asphalt that was there. This painting is called Voices, and it's the funeral of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Uh, Rosa's coffin is empty because her body hasn't yet been retrieved from the canal in which it was thrown after she was murdered. The uh, zone above the coffins um, has r some of Rosa's, some of the last words she wrote, uh, repeated and repeated over and over again, meant to resonate like sound, meant to pulsate and vibrate like sound. Uh, those words were in German, ich bin, ich war, ich werde sein, which is I am, I was, and I will be. Rosa meant it to refer to the revolution that was 
crushed at the time when she was killed and crushed. The date of these paintings is 1983. Uh, this one is called Procession, and it's part of the same funeral scene with Rose's head carried on a placard uh, by the uh, crowd. At the same time, I was doing paintings of Alice Stevens, my mother, and uh, placing her in juxtaposition, as I've said, to uh, Rosa Luxemburg. This painting is called Go Gentle, and it represents um, different stages in the life of Alice Stevens. The title comes from the Dylan Thomas poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. That painting is... Um, in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington right now in a show called The Artist's Mother, which I think the uh, National Portrait Gallery wanted to have on during the Mother's Day. Mother's Day comes up on May 8th. Um, I am afraid that my painting d doesn't have quite that sentimental feeling that Mother's Day usually evokes, but. I wanted to do a painting in this sequence about Rosa Luxemburg's life of the canal into which her body was thrown, and I started to do three small studies. I don't usually make studies. I usually make the studies on the painting and keep changing and changing. But I had a feeling that the large view of the bridge over the canal with the vegetation on the embankment on either side uh, would simply end up being a landscape without the power and the meaning that I wanted it to have. And so I made some studies. I also switched from acrylic to oil. I'd been using acrylic in these other paintings, but I changed to oil thinking maybe that would help me to get the resonance and the richness in the paint and in the landscape, the waterscape that I wanted. So I, I did the three small studies. They are like three feet across, I think, and they were intended as studies for a 12-foot painting. Um, I was forced, as you can see, to use lettering on them also to try to intensify the meaning. I also boxed them with a rectangular line around each one. This says De Landwehr Canal, which is the name of the canal, and here I, I've turned it to night and the bridge is almost invisible. It became, uh, in this version, totally, or not, um, not totally, but almost abstract, almost totally abstract and there I scratched the words above. I started the large painting uh, not knowing yet what would happen or how I could make that painting work for me. I started with the first image of the uh, brownish embankments and the silver river between. And when I had the painting done, I thought it wasn't working. It didn't do what I needed to do. And so I added two figures of Alice to either side of Rosa's canal. And as I worked on the painting, I began to eliminate the bridge over the canal. And I found that it made a great difference to do that. And the painting became a kind of special thing for me, where uh, the void became an extremely important presence. And I felt that the painting was a painting of three, three presences, the two of Alice and the one of the space in between. I called the painting Four River, which is the river uh, that I grew up on or next to. At the same time, I was writing some poems about my mother, which I think are very much part of the work. Some people died who never died before, she said. They died just now, she said, reading the times. Her skin was pink, her flesh concealed the bones inside. She pretended she was a chair, hoping death would flash past sat still as a sofa, a dress laid over, two shoes neatly placed. This painting is called A Life. One other poem that I wrote for her at the very end of her life. You can go, I hug you close, take care of your ribs. 
Keep your arms in their hollows. Don't talk. The milk that is spilled in the well of your neck, I will write white words with it if you'll be still. Unfold the layers of your skin that let out a limb. Make a pact with brittle or pliant. Under the blanket, ends of the ribs, north of the saddle bone, up on the blanket, sponge of your veins, chips of your fingers, float like a shell. Seize tissue to seize stone. End formally. Hold up your head on its hawk co cords. Hood with your eyes the dark you see ahead of me. Scratch your nose a little. Tuck in your mouth over the drowsy gullet. Suck in the places your skin falls to dream under the jutting bone. There is great beauty. Drink milk. Color comes to the lips. You thrum when I hug you and squeeze you as if you were my newborn daughter. Brush with your hand the back of my hand with faint desire. Don't eat. Turn your head to the wall. Nothing has flavor. Cold paste on a sharp-edged spoon. Not for you. No, you've decided. Serenely you smile in control of your life. You're safe deep inside. Curl up in your cot, strapped to its sides. Nothing can happen. You are washed, changed, pulled from slumber for riddles you have no time for. Close down your eyes. Soon I'll be gone. Clamp shut your ears and jaw. Find your way to the smallest light. Enter so softly it's not an event. I won't even know. This is called Forming the Fifth International, and in it Rosa and Alice meet in a very strange green space and in a very uneasy juxtaposition. I then picked up The Life of Rosa Luxemburg and did three paintings which preceded the New Museum show but entered into the um, imagery of the New Museum show, uh, which was an installation called One Plus or Minus One. This is called Rosa Luxemburg Attends the Second International. And these are the murderers of Rosa Luxemburg. You may remember that in an early collage there was a little mm, mutilated photograph uh, which was um, the source of this uh, image. And a second version of the murder is um, a smaller painting. The others were six and a half by <coughs> 10 or 12. And this is something like 55 inches by 80 inches. From these, I was, uh, at, I was do working on these. And then I was asked to do the installation at the new museum. And given a huge, enormous space to fill and made two photo murals that are 11 feet by 17 feet. On the way to doing that, I made studies, some of which are at Real Artways right now. This is the uh, one part of the installation at the New Museum. It's called Second, the Second International. And here, the image is constructed from photographs of the original photograph and photographs of the painting. And then they are combined and repainted. And they've also gone through uh, various reproduction um, media which change their texture. This is Eden Hotel, which is the hotel where the murderers drank to celebrate the killing of Rosa Luxemburg. In the original idea for the installation at the New Museum, I was going to put a series of questions which would, I hoped, confront the viewer and force them to involve themselves in the relationship between the two photographs. Questions like, um, what do these photographs have in common? What's the relationship of the woman in each of the photographs? What is the relationship of the women across the photographs to each other, and so on. Uh, I decided eventually not to use the questions, feeling that it was too narrow a lens, too narrow a focus. I, I myself don't like to be put in a situation by an artist where I have to answer a series of questions or I have to sort of follow some game plan. I resent that. And I resist it. I think Mary Beth Adelson, who's a good friend of mine, once asked me if I would tell her a menstruation story that she could include in her menstruation story boxes. 
And I didn't, it isn't that I would have not wanted to tell a menstruation story or that I couldn't have thought up one, but uh, I didn't know if I just wanted to take part in this game in some way. It would be a different thing to talk about it in a, in a uh, consciousness raising session. So the next slides are a series of the studies which I originally made as very small collages, which, as I say, were painted on and recollaged and so on, and um, then made into the 60 by 40 uh, pieces that are in real artways, and then chose two for the installation at uh, the new museum. And there were three texts in the New Museum. Um, I think they're repeated in real art ways also. Uh, one describing the situation that is the Second International, one describing the Eden Hotel, and a kind of summarizing statement, which I'll read. The title, one plus or minus one. A woman within or in juxtaposition to a patriarchal system. In the first case, left-wing politics. In the second, the military. In the Second International, Rosa Luxemburg penetrates the unity and sameness of the world leaders of socialism at the 1904 Congress in Amsterdam. In Eden Hotel, the waitress serves the wine to the killers of Rosa Luxemburg who celebrate the day following the murder, January 16, 1919. Presence, absence, substitution, proportion, quota, power, powerlessness, one less, one more or less. Rosa Luxemburg flared across the European dark like a meteor, an aberration. Her murder restores the usual dark. The waitress brings her tray. The usual faces look out. Order is restored in Berlin, in Chile, in El Salvador. Thank you. is a photographer who also teaches at the Hartford Art School at the University of Hartford. She has had solo shows in New York City, at Art City, the Concord Gallery, Texas Gallery, and in New England at Real Artways in Hartford and at Zone Gallery in Springfield. She was honored last fall with her first retrospective exhibition at the International Center of Photography in New York. She's received grants from the Massachusetts Council on the Arts, the New York State Foundation for Artists, the National Endowment for the Arts, and Polaroid Corporation. And her work is in the collections of the Brooklyn Museum, the Fogg Museum, the Albright Knox Art Gallery, the Chase Manhattan Collection, and many, many others. Her work receives frequent reviews in art periodicals, both here and in Europe. I give to you Ellen Carey. Thank you. I think we're just going to move to slides now. I know it's, <laughs> it's getting on in time. Um, so go ahead. And I just want to talk a little bit about uh, the context of the panel tonight, the essentialists versus uh, postmodern deconstru deconstructivists. And I think probably I might be a crossover. <laughs> um, also, many of you talk about Barbara Kruger and Cindy Sherman, and, and I, w I knew those artists uh, when they were very young artists. And uh, Barbara Kruger's early work used to be quilts, and Cindy Sherman used to make cut-out paper doll stand-ups. So I thought that might be interesting to know as a sort of aside. Um, I work in photography, which is, uh, <coughs> as many of you know, just about 150 years old. It doesn't really have the baggage of painting and sculpture. Um, I think there are many cliches abound about women artists, the history of uh, 
their non-existence or um, why they haven't been any great women artists. Really, the, the culprit, I think, is the uh, what I call um, erase mode or the politics of silence. Um, I'm just going to show you a survey of work from 1978 to the present, and you will see a development of uh, ideas. Uh, this, I started out with the self-portrait in 1978. Many of the works have uh, references to um, camouflage, masks, body decoration. Um, they also uh, are about what the photograph self is or what is presented through the camera as mirror and then presented to the real world and then the overpainting sort of represents the kind of internal or non-seen uh, expression, if you will. Uh, in 1980 to 83, I began working with the figure. Uh, these are very large uh, photographs, 40, 60, 60, 80. Um, at the time, large photographs were not really being done that much as they are today as we go towards the 90s. A lot of the configurations have to do with um, <clears throat> celestial formations and spirals and this is a DNA double helix. At the time I was making this work, uh, which I didn't really realize until someone pointed out to me, which is interesting, uh, was that the images were of, of the male figure. And uh, I said to this friend of mine, I said, well, you know, what's the big deal? I mean, I'm a heterosexual female and I'm looking at uh, the male. And he said, well, you know, Ellen, uh, the history of nude in uh, the art doesn't really have that many men nudes in it. And, you know, this is a bit provocative. And I found this to be true. Uh, it became, I found myself curated out of shows. Um, or an interesting uh, case in point was a show at the Albright Knox where the museum uh, was uh, called Figures, Forms, and Expression. It was, you know, David Sally, Joel Shapiro, Robert Longo, Leon Golub, et cetera, and so forth. And any of the work that was sort of uh, neutered or genderless in its uh, presentation was at the museum. And any of the work that had political overtones, such as John Ahern, or homosexual overtones, such as Robert Maplethorpe, or myself, where I showed, um, you know, parts of the male body was over at the hall walls, the alternative space. So there is a very puritanical streak and conservative attitude, I think, uh, even today. Uh, 1984, I returned to the self as idea, leaving behind this sort of more autobiographical references, uh, becoming more and more uh, androgynous, less gender specific. Uh, a lot of the imagery has to do with, I, uh, I believe Rudolf Arnheim in his, uh, in his books talk about that the uh, visual structures ha are basically the square, i.e. grid, etc., or the circle. And I would say that my imagery is involved with the circle and all that's metaphorical and symbolic meaning. In 1984, I started working with Polaroid camera, which is a very special situation. Uh, there are only five large 20 by 24 cameras in the world, and um, I approached Polaroid, and they said, uh, sure, come on, uh, work on it. And many artists work on this camera. There's hundreds of artists a year work on it. But then there are a few uh, group of artists who have breakthroughs in their work or from time to time have affinities or whatever. And it turns out that my work and the materials just happen to sort of link up in this sort of unusual way. Um, at this time, I began to realize that I was painting with light. Um, conceptually, I think of myself as a collagist, which is basically a, a modernist uh, practice. Um, I'm interested in aspects of seeing the psychological meaning of layering. Also, you know, the exploration of self vis-a-vis -vis also being female. Um, I moved away from painting on the uh, pictures altogether by the end of 84, and I'm just sh showing you some highlights from basically uh, this last year's work.
So a lot of the lié motifs in the work do have to do with this idea of uh, the history of body decoration, uh, masks, but they also have to do with the human need for transcendence. Here I'm starting to uh, split the self off and make multiple uh, pools or visual I don't know, somebody said it looked very schizophrenic. I don't know if I agree with that, but... Um, a lot of the structures that I use, the patterns, come from... The source material is in mathematics, especially fractal geometry and science. Uh, this is a symbol for the golden mean, or the golden section, or the golden proportion. It is not a symbol of a vagina, as someone asked me. Um, I often use the primary colors as a homage to uh, sort of the basicness of, um, of a homage to not only the Bauhaus constructivists, but also to homage to the primariness of colors. And these are the later ones, which are decidedly more abstract and moving away from the self altogether. And this is the last one I made. Anyway, thank you. And to finish our presentation, we have Patricia Hills. Patricia Hills is an art historian specializing in American art. She is an associate professor in the Art History Department of Boston University and director of the Boston University Art Gallery. She's been an adjunct curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art and has taught at, in the Fine Arts and Performing Arts Division of York College at Columbia University and at New York University. She's a prolific scholar, author of eight consequential books and catalogs and dozens of articles for national and local periodicals and museum publications. Of particular interest for our discussions this evening are her book on Alice Neal and her recent articles in Art New England on contemporary criticism, political and social art, and the women's movement. I give you Patricia Hills. I think I'll stand. Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I'm not really going to enter into this debate about uh, essentialists versus deconstruction. What I'd like to do, though, is to just talk about the way I'm looking at things now, and maybe I'm looking at them in an old-fashioned way, but I think I'm also looking at them because there has been some really good writing about women's art uh, lately. And I have a little prologue, and then the prologue will go into a discussion of three women artists. Everything you see, you hear, you feel, you experience, becomes part of your knowledge of life. Those moments you forget becomes things stored in your mind, on the shelf, disconnected, but not irrevocably lost. The moments you remember become, for you, the past of the history you daily construct, in your effort to achieve wholeness. There are times when, when what you presently experience cries out for the forgotten moments that will make the present understandable. The wonder of the mind is that these forgotten moments can be retrieved, but often only with help. The art of the past that still exists in the present or that exists in memory or in history often has the power to awaken to consciousness those forgotten moments, and so does the art of the present. To be in touch on a daily basis with art, whether that art be painting, poetry, dance, drama, or what have you, is to keep in readiness your ability to retrieve those forgotten moments. The art that does this thus becomes part of your living history. It becomes part of your wholeness. This is what we mean when we talk about the power of art to enrich our lives. 
One of my major undertakings as an art historian is to understand the relationship between the historically political and sociological circumstances of women and their individual psychologies. Since my medium of inquiry is painting, I am embarked on the study of these relationships as they are expressed by women artists and experienced by the viewers. Let me suggest as a metaphor the science laboratory which carries on basic research. Recently, feminist art critics and art historians have published their methods of inquiry. They have come up with useful words, terms, and concepts, all of which we can appropriate as tools for our own research. We become aware that there is a difference between the phrase feminine sensibility and gender difference. The first phrase we might have used only with difficulty since it suggested an essentialism that we are still not too sure we agree with or not. The word gender we now define as a socially determined construct, a word very similar to the word race. The article by Thalia Guma Peterson and Patricia Matthews that has been mentioned today already on the state of current feminist art history and criticism has been the most useful in laying out a floor plan for the modern basic research laboratory of feminist inquiry. A floor plan includes up-to-date equipment and manuals for methods. What they said and what I thought about when I read what they said will be incorporated in my remarks today. Now I want to remind all of you that when we're reading feminist criticism, we're not reading it and taking notes and memorizing it. We're reading it and we're thinking about it. We're thinking about how it applies to the way we really look at art and the way we experience art. And that's the point I'm trying to make. When we look at art too, we incorporate that into us. We see how it fits, how it might help to really give us that sense of wholeness, which I feel we are, we are all searching for. We all know that the art of the past and the future contribute to the shaping of the present. Memories and the expressions of history suggest options for present actions. Hopes and the assurance that the sun will come up tomorrow are beacons guiding our present actions as well. I would like to talk this evening not about the past per se or the present and future, but about the presentness of the past, the presentness of the present, and the presentness of the future in some examples of contemporary art. And I would like to focus my remarks on the art of three women, Sue Coe, who for me represents the presentness of the present, May Stevens, who represents the presentness of the past, and Joyce, and Joyce and Kozloff, who represents the presentness of the future. There are other candidates I could have brought in. Adrian Piper is one. Uh, Cindy Sherman is a little problematical, but she, I believe, would have fit also. The works of these three artists seem to me to express the various ways we can think about the political and historical world outside of our consciousnesses, the interior world of ourselves, and the intersection of the two in time and place. Let us begin with the present. Um, may I have the first two slides, please? This is Zuko's Woman Tied to a Pole, 1985. Coe's paintings are blunt, direct, visceral, no subtlety, raging at social evils, a sharp pain in the gut, a wound in the throat, a gurgle scream, violent ejaculation, quick death. Her subjects, the police, victims, heroes, are figures of a hallucinatory substance situated in scenes illuminated, illuminated as if by strobe lights piercing through blackness, all present time, no future, no past. She deals with the most immediate issues of our time, the sexual and economic abuse of women, children, and third world people, the corruptions of power, the pervasive pathology of a bankrupt and decadent society. Here are more examples. The one we just looked at, Woman Tied to a Pole. The next one, 
called Going Over the Fence, War Resistor at the Missile Silo, 1984. Bobby Sands, Northern Ireland of 1982. It's mixed media. Many of these are mixed media. This one called Homeless Women in Penn Station, Can You Spare Any Change, 1985. This one, U.S. military successfully bombs a mental hospital in Granada, 1984. And here's your baby in the bathtub. <laughs> President Reagan takes a hot bath of 1984. Suko bludgeons you with these images, but you do not forget the monstrous vision of the New Bedford woman in this work right here. Woman walks into a bar, is raped by four men on a pool table while 20 watch. 1983, can you make that out? I hope the, the figure is sort of taking his trousers off is down in the, in the foreground. These pictures by Coe crouch in your memory, ready to spring up when you read in the papers or hear on the radio one more outrage by those who hold power. But she has also done some positive images. It's not all just sort of grimness. As in this strike poster that she did for the traveling exhibition, uh, Images of Labor. This is uh, done in about 1980, 81. The posters in that exhibition, Images of Labor, were commissioned by the Bread and Roses Project of District 1199, the Hospital Workers Union. Mark Bonner's idea was to have artists design artworks that went along with famous quotations. May Stevens did one for this, but I'm not showing it tonight. Uh, the quotation that Suko used uh, comes from the words of a sit-down striker in Akron, Ohio, in 1936. And the quote goes as follows. We were nervous, and we didn't know how we could do it. Those machines had kept going as long as we could remember. When we finally pulled the switch and there was some quiet, I finally remembered something that I was a human being, that I could stop those machines, that I was better than those machines any time." End quote. The iconic frontality of the central figure gives him that same immediacy as we see in Poe's other work. Very immediate, very much of the present. May Stevens' paintings represent to me the presentness of the past, the continual presence of memory and history. You may recall her early work, and we've already seen it, uh, the iconic controlled anger at patriarchal society and the Big Daddy pictures, which she did in the late 1960s and 1970s, Big Daddy Paper Doll of 1970, or Pox Americana, 1973. A transition work for Stevens was her mystery and politics in 1978 where she brought real people into her paintings. People from the past are also there, such as her mother, Alice Stevens, which is in the upper left. You see her holding the baby. And you also see Rosa Luxemburg, sort of in the central upper right, uh, with a large hat on. But then there were also people from the past, as I said, people from the present, such as Pat Steer over there on the left, Betsy Damon in the lower left, uh, the 7,000-year-old uh, woman, uh, Poppy Johnson holding the two babies, uh, Carol Duncan, myself, Mae Stevens herself standing in the rear, Joan Snyder, uh, Elizabeth Weatherford, um, and others. From this painting, she went back to the present. Uh, um, from this painting, she went back to retrieving the past for, for the present in the series Ordinary and Extraordinary. Her paintings are now subtle, solid forms bathed in gray mists with accents of pink, magenta, green, and blue. The subjects are two, as we have seen already tonight. Alice Stevens, a figure from Stevens' personal life and memory, who lived out her life in mute and anonymous existence in a small town nursing home. Alive, when May first began painting her, she has been dead for the last two years, but living, in mem living on in memory in these paintings. And you see the uh, uh, Everybody Knows Me of 19, 
uh, the one we just saw in 1981, Everyone Knows Me, Four River, which we just saw in 1983. And you have over there the suggestion, which I think is important, that I've always seen that as a small hand on the side, which is like in the process of painting the picture. And then the last one uh, that May also showed called A Life of 1984. Alice is a contrast to Rosa Luxemburg, the communist revolutionary from history, a public his a figure murdered long ago in 1919 for her political beliefs and thrown into the Landwehr Canal in Berlin. Her dead corpse did not rise to the surface until months later. And we've seen demonstration, too, about Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht's funeral, which represents, Stephen told me once, I'm quoting May, quote, all the demonstrations I ever went to, all the assassinations, all the people struggling to change things and express things, end quote. And then you have voices also, as I this mention again of the past, the past being in the present, you know, all the demonstrations, all the, the assassinations, all the funerals, as you see up here. And then those words in that painting, ich war, ich bin, ich werde sein, also retrieving the past for the present. And the murders also, these of course represent all the murders, all the assassinations and assassins of history. An ordinary woman, Alice, and an extraordinary woman, Rosa. Or is it the other way around? And who are we? How do we situate ourselves and the women in our lives in our construction of our own histories? Can we be Rosa? Will we be Alice? Rosa's immortality lies in her political writings. Alice's legacy was only her daughter, May. No other children, no property, but in a sense, she has the immortality of representation, flesh caught in paint on canvas, as you see in Go Gentle. The substantial fleshiness of the mother Alice, heavy legs emerging out of a thinly painted canvas, hands clawing at the other side of the picture plane, signaling mutely of her own existence. In fact, through May, but unknowingly, she has defied anonymity by surviving as a subject for art. These are figures outside our space, on the wall, as you see them on the screen here, windows into collective memory, secured for the present. I want to move now to Joyce Kozlov. I like to think of Joyce Kozlov's art as offering us the presentness of the future. Kozlov's images, at times abstract, at times figurative, have shifted venues from paintings of vibrant color and pattern to the tiled surfaces of public spaces. These latest works, which can be fully experienced only in situ, are all placed in spaces where travelers pass through, in airports, train depots, or municipal transit stations. They mark a moment and a locus for a hurrying man, woman, or child in transition. You see here part of the uh, uh, the Humboldt Hospital subway station in Buffalo, which he did around uh, 83-84. And then you see a detail of it, uh, the detail of the tiles, another detail of the tiles. Moving on to the Wilmington, Am Wilmington Delaware Amtrak station done uh, in the early 80s. And then you see a detail here with the railing. You can see through the tile in the background. But when the tra traveler is transformed into a viewer by the simple decision to pause and study the decoration, she or he does not abandon the state of being active. Indeed, these large decorations demand the viewer's active engagement in discovering within the profusion of details the embedded images, colors, and decorative motifs associated with a specific local cultural geography. Those motifs are there because Kozlov has researched the social history of the site and has drawn on imagery which would relate to that history. You have William Penn for the Philadelphia Amstrike Station. This is the sub suburban train station, as you can see him there. 
And for the San Francisco in, uh, Airport International Terminal, and you see a, a view of uh, this mural is in the baggage uh, area. And in the details, you can see uh, some of the references to rock and roll memorabilia, blue jeans, and psychedelia, as well as sort of Art Deco California houses. And then you look at the Harvard Square Station, which went up a few years ago, was opened a few years ago, and there's a view of it. And then you can see in the details here uh, all sorts of references to the local scene, Indians, Puritans, gravestone imagery, weather vanes, um, and such things as like cows and things like that in the subway. <coughs> But it is not so much history and memory that one thinks about in these joyous and playful decorations as much as thinking about the possibilities of a graffiti-less, unalienated future when people can and will enjoy the free play of inventive design in safe, violence-free public places and spaces. It is a future which I see promised here in these works. When art as we know it that is, art as a precious commodity, will have withered away along with the oppressive state, and everyone will have the opportunity to realize their own fulfillment in the making and crafting of art. Thus, three women painting and making art that move us, or at least move me, the present presentness of Guru's strident voice, the past and present with the memorable words works of Stevens, and a future vision as embedded in the public art of Joyce Kozlov. I don't really see any men doing works that move me as much in this way as the works of these uh, artists and other women as well. I think that my remarks today have been not about women changing art as much as about art changing women. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, you would all like a chance to stand up and stretch, and uh, please feel free to do so. We will take down the screen, and the panel will move up uh, to the tables, and in about three or four minutes, we'll be ready to entertain your questions. Thank you. I gather that most people are back in. Um, Victor, there is a question whether or not these shining lights are absolutely essential. They are? <laughs> okay. We'll handle it until our eyes go, until we go blind. We're, we're being spotlighted for video. Um, well, I think that uh, we have all received a considerable amount of information. I don't know about you, but my head is already spinning. But uh, the panelists are here, available to answer your questions. Do you have any? After all that. <laughs> could start with simple things if you'd like. Hobbies and interests? <laughs> yes. What deconstructionism, uh, uh, deconstructionist criticism is? Yeah. Uh, could I direct that to Betsy? <laughs> you don't do the historian. <laughs> uh, deconstructionism is uh, well. It's uh, that itself is a term which evolves out of theories of semiotics applied frequently, uh, ha uh, in recent years, applied vastly to literary criticism and now moving into art criticism and art historical methodology. Um, 
which uh, this <laughs> you had to ask that, didn't you? <laughs> of course. <laughs> this approach is more interested in the process of uh, of communication, of analyzing the process of communication, and in our realm, the process of communication through visual images, rather than the specific the the the, con the process of communication, which has to do with the construction of meaning how we read meaning, as opposed to dealing with the construction of uh, specific objects and what their value may be as objects. The focus sh is shifted to the construction and the deconstruction of meaning of those objects within a social, economic, uh, vastly cultural context. Uh, the deconstructionist approach in general will focus on a specific time and cultural period to assess the entire construct of that culture, ideologies within that culture that create meaning, in other words, how we see, how we read what we see, and to then um, deconstruct what are considered to be truths or givens by assessing the culture outside of the specific realm of art if we're talking about our specific realm of literature, if we're talking about literature. So it's a, it's a much vaster kind of approach than most of the critical methodologies that have been used in, uh, in art criticism or liter literary criticism of the past 50 years. Would you like to add to that, anybody? <laughs> the fundamental question, which is not so much, Lynn. <laughs> Yes. Yes. No, definitely not. It emerges out of out of semiotics, linguistics, anthropology, and generally out of France. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now widely adapted to <laughs> English criticism and making inroads into the diaspora. <laughs> yes. arrested actually several times in Greece, but not that time. Um, the, those peak sanctuaries are built up in the hills in Crete and they're, they're, uh, they make special treks to them or in many cases they're, they're sort of abandoned except for sheep herders who go up into those areas. Mm -hmm. And so I just discovered this one and I would go back to it. Generally there wouldn't be anyone around and they're completely open. Um, and, and generally nobody but a, a priest would go behind that uh, altar, but I did. <laughs> the, um, I, it was a, a, a real sacrilege, and I felt awkward doing it in a way. I mean, I, I did not uh, want, want to insult or assault the culture, which I was very interested in, in that itself, at the same time that um, it was important to me to, to do the piece in that space. So this sort of little goddess dance ritual that I did was, part of it was about um, breaking those rules. Well, it could be very refreshing because it's such a, it's totally patriarchal. Right. Uh, one of the women that went with me was Greek, um, but American Greek, and she was very refreshed by it, and her grandmother, but uh, later when I came back, here and the picture was ex uh, the photograph was exhibited in a gallery. There was a, a an academic, fairly liberal Greek who was very upset by it. He was. <laughs> Getting back to the idea of the essential versus the construction, when I was listening to everyone's talk, it seemed like the essential was saying. Right now, 
first that the people could be not as essential in terms of the kind of images and the women's movement, you know, that was sort of solicited in terms of the body and the you know, their images being sexual. And I just really want to understand this because I think it's really important, you know, different kind of statement that women are saying. Are you saying that they that they no longer want to to look at their images and just the close context, you know, the sixties of that kind of consciousness that, you know, woman's image and body can come into a different kind of kind of uh, you know, images in terms of the ideology of the day and that we have more things to say that we're more than just the body and that what we want to say is more it's, it's not limiting. Is that basically what you're saying? Anybody. I was thinking as you were talking about the fact that there was always um, a problem in most of our minds about, even the minds of the women who made such images, there was always a problem about presenting images of women's body because we found that they were misread or misunderstood. That when Carol Lee Schneeman or Hannah Wilkie or someone else would do maybe a performance where they would be nude or do some kind of art in which um, their nude bodies would figure, um, the, the point that they were trying to make about the woman's body would be misread by their audiences very, very often, and in fact would be seen as pornographic or would be seen as uh, a turn-on in some way that they didn't want the, their bodies to be seen. So there was always a question in our minds about the use of the women's body, a woman's body in art. Um, I think that that kind of natural development has led to, I don't know about natural, a point now where there are artists in the deconstructionist camp who do not think it's possible to use the image of a woman at all because their concept, except to analyze it as a kind of misuse of woman, their concept is often that we do not know what a woman is and the images of women are misleading and deceptive and they have been the, the model for them has been created for us in a way that is damaging to us. So then it becomes very difficult, if you follow the, along this line, to use the image of a woman at all. But those are kind of, that's kind of an extreme, I, I would say. A lot of the deconstructionist work uses images of the female that have already been produced. In other words, there's this other term. I hope we don't get bogged down in the labels because really, it really doesn't matter. The only important thing is what you all think of the work that you saw on the slides. That seems to me to be the, the interesting thing to talk about is the art. But a lot of this um, new postmodern work appropriates images from the dominant culture. So you're seeing a whole lot of images that have already appeared, you know, from tabloids, TV shows, from wherever that are now being incorporated into the work of art. That's one of the clues. <laughs> and what you're seeing is less and less paint. But to uh, another kind of angle about this is when Barbara Kruger says, we will not play nature to your culture, one can understand exactly why she wants to say that. She does not want women to be located only in the body, and she doesn't want women to be thought of as um, without a mind. On the other hand, to follow that as an artist, to say, okay, you know, I can't do anything that shows my relationship to nature is ridiculous. I mean, that kind of um, follow the leader and, and uh, limitation doesn't make any sense at all. The statement is valid. But what you do with it is not necessarily swallow it and guide your art by it. It doesn't make any sense. I think what, what many um, women artists that I've talked to are thinking about is ways in which they can um, use ideas from both of these areas and other areas and somehow layer their work or somehow work with the contradictions and even make art out of the quandary rather than choosing one or the other. Um, 
also i think that we're talking about very specific activities you know and you have to sort of bear in mind that there are many women artists making paintings and sculpture nancy graves judy faff dorothea rockenberg uh, Roth susan rothenberg dorothea rockburn <laughs> <coughs> the two r's and um you know that what we're talking about tonight it seems to be almost a, a kind of a specific practice you know that came out the essentials or whatever the early um, feminist art movement really came out because there was such a, a need you know to have the work looked at like I said <coughs> There was this huge silence and a race, and you know, as a young artist, I had nowhere. There were no history books that I could really look at to say, okay, I mean, I can't believe that there weren't any women making art since the beginning of time. That just seemed too enormous a lie. And you have to realize that that reaction, which is going to be, you know, a pretty big one, uh, all the collective guilt on the male part, we hope. <coughs> and um, so. <laughs> So anyway, uh, you know, the work that we were talking about um, tonight sort of is, is showing that, you know, especially like Barbara Kruger, I mean, Barbara Kruger hangs in shows with, you know, Susan Rothenberg, for example. So <clears throat> there are women artists who are just painting and making sculpture um, who are feminists as well, um, but their political, you know, their, their work is not specifically political in its uh, visual mode, if you will. But that's actually an important question, um, is how visible one's politics are in one's work, um, which is part of the, um, it seems to me, debate, or the feminist debate around deconstruction is, will politics be deconstructed out of the image <laughs> to some extent? Yes. Any specific reason why oil used in the barrel? I read from the last. I think she was going to say that. What? We just came from a funeral. <laughs> we, we noticed that also. <laughs> it's cheaper. <laughs> it all matches. And also, it's it's like spring hasn't really come yet, you know. It's like today was a very gray day, and it's not a. You we're know. all depressed. <laughs> Wouldn't you be depressed if you were, you know, it's <laughs> all those years of oppression and repression <laughs> since the beginning of time? If you read Simone de Beauvoir, the second sex, you will be very depressed, and you will wear black for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll consider that at dinner afterwards. Uh, <laughs> Suzanne. Along those lines of depression, I, I'd really like to know how each of you feel about the way things are right now in 1988. You, you know, you, you read all the statistics that the girly girls have, and then you start to try to figure out what's going to happen next and where we're going and what's happening. How, how are you all feeling about that? Are you feeling hopeful or are you feeling well, it's it's tough. It's <laughs> tough. Um, I think for me, I go uh, through peer. It comes in waves. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, personally, it's difficult. It's very difficult. I mean, sometimes you sort of push it away and you don't notice it, or and then sometimes it'll just hit you in the face and you just, you know, it's very. Uh, distressing. It's not easy to continue. I think it takes a lot of uh, commitment, a lot of moral courage um, to keep on making work in the face of, you know, very little support. Um, you look at your male colleagues and you, you know, you say, hey, <laughs> I thought about changing my name to Alan Carey at one point. I was in this uh, <laughs> show, <coughs> the San Paolo Biennale, which had ten men and three women, and I noticed the, all the men had dealers and, you know, were you know, very well off, and Cindy Sherman had maybe just started making money, and Nancy Dwyer was complaining about <laughs> how poor she was. So there are, you know, real uh, ramifications that do 
fit into and are very frustrating because in, in order to make work, you have to have support, you have to have financial support, uh, you have to feel that there's a kind of spiritual, you know, collective group, and uh, I think it's remote territory. I'm much more optimistic. I, I shouldn't be wearing black. Um, <laughs> I, I think that um, given what's going on in the country and given the disasters that the Reagan administration has brought to us, that the 90s are going to look a lot like the 60s. Um, I think that the Committed to Print show at the Museum of Modern Art, which for those of you who don't know is a show of social protest prints, is um, indicates that there's that that women and many women are political artists more so than men for obvious reasons um, that there is new license to make political work um, I think what's um, I think women's work is starting to sell that there are top women artists around um, I think it's still hard to get a dealer it's still hard to make a living um, I don't think anybody should um, I think the illusion that um, because as, because we have a you know a handful of, of millionaires running around the art world in their 20s, um, everyone thinks that you can make money being an artist again. You know I think that bubble has to be burst. But on the other hand, I think it's a very exciting and interesting time to to make art. Uh, there's tremendous motivation for it, and there's there is a new kind of I think there's a feeling that there's a need for it. There's a new kind of licensing for feminist artists going on that um, you really didn't see in the 70s. In the 70s, we saw alternative spaces collapsing. Um, we saw women really disappearing from the art world. And I think Guerrilla Girls have done a good job. I think they've made a difference. I think um, the art establishment is quite aware that there's a, a group of gorillas looking over their shoulders. And um, I think things are really going to continue to happen. I wanted to say something about um, both something that Sherry said in her presentation and also about Guerrilla Girls. Um, I think, I believe Sherry said that uh, on the East Coast, uh, the women artists and the feminist art movement was interested in economic parity. Uh, my participation was in heresies, and heresies was not interested in economic parity. Heresy was, heresies was interested in decentralizing art. It was interested in um, encouraging women all over the country, and in fact, we also aimed even to be international. But we wanted to discuss the issues, and we turned away from the art world. And we encouraged the creation of one's own spaces and one's own uh, structures, institutions, organizations, or whatever. And it was a whole thing about spreading out and reaching out to all the women who were making art and weren't known, or wanted to make art and didn't dare, or whatever that was. So there was this kind of um, sense of community that we were building. And it was not focused towards the art world. It wasn't focused towards New York. It wasn't focused towards making money or getting into a gallery, although that's always an issue. I mean, that, was, that certainly didn't disappear. And I think that the thing about Guerrilla Girls is that it has focused on a single issue, which is uh, economic uh, and, and the recognition that goes with the, the economic kind of thing, which is a useful thing, but it's a one issue kind of thing. And uh, as far as depression in the art world, um, I think that there is an awful lot of interesting work being done by women artists right now, and a lot of it is being recognized, not to the degree that it needs to be, and not on the economic level that it should be, but there's a tremendous amount of interesting work uh, by women artists going on, and we've just seen a small fraction of it tonight. I'd also like to speak about the Women's Caucus for Art, which started in the early 70s as a caucus within the College Art Association. And that has been meeting annually at the same time that the CAA meets. It met in Houston uh, this last February, the year before it was in Boston. And I know that, that most, uh, and there are many chapters all over the country, about 100 different chapters, or maybe um, I mean, there are a lot of people who belong now, and most of us, many of us belong to it as well. But um, uh, the, the women who are involved with the Women's Caucus for Art make a special effort to include women of color and older women. 
as groups, you know, then in the annual awards, of course the annual, the honorees have been older women because that's the nature of the award, but always including women, uh, uh, Native American women, uh, or, or uh, black women, uh, Hispanic women, and I don't know if there are men's organizations of artists who go out of their way to do that and also at the talks and the annual meetings, sessions devoted to uh, Latin American women. I think this has been a real effort and, I, and I've, I applaud that, you know, and also the activities of trying to get women who, who aren't, don't have a lot of money or maybe don't have a college education to include them. I see that as a very positive thing. Um, I think my... My point is maybe a little different coming from the Midwest. I know uh, uh, for a women's caucus panel a couple of years ago, I did a project um, researching how many uh, current students, graduate students or women students, male and female students, were actually aware of the women's art movement in the 70s or what they thought or knew about the history of women artists and, uh, and minorities in general. And I think uh, it was quite disappointing how little they knew. I mean, I felt as if a lot of things had already been lost and it had only been t 10 years since the, since the information had had uh, been e exposed to them. They'd sort of heard of Judy Chicago and that was about... So that was real upsetting to me and from that time on I went back into working on a more grassroots sort of level. I think one of my fir first criticisms of the of the feminist movement as a whole in the 70s was that it, it was rather elitist and didn't reach some of the... Uh, a, a lot of women. And so uh, I think now I, I'm more a optimistic about that in terms of where I'm from in the Midwest. There are a lot of, of interest on the part of just community women's group in a history of women and artists, but primarily instigated by, by people from Women's Caucus or someone who has who is presented the information to them originally. I do think with, the, with this uh, notion of the deconstructivist, whatever, postmodern approach. I mean, they have really become a commodity. Uh, uh, it is, it, the commodification of, of, these, of these political works, I think, is very positive. On the other hand, it, is, it, it can sometimes divest the work of its power. Uh, and I think it's important that the guerrilla girls keep at it because the women doing that work or the minorities or other groups creating that work should be the ones who are being shown rather than people who are borrowing from that work. Um, I would like to just add a footnote to what Pat mentioned about the Women's Caucus. There is um, a chapter of the Women's Caucus in formation in Connecticut. Uh, there was one a few years ago that sort of disbanded, but it's, uh, there's a push to reform a chapter in Connecticut, and if anybody is interested in joining the Connecticut chapter of the Women's Caucus, you should contact Cindy McTaggart in Thomaston. I don't think there are too many McTaggarts in Thomaston, so you can check information for that number. Um, I, th I personally am rather optimistic for the coming decade as well, and the optimism has emerged just really in the past year because of um, the fact that I spend a lot of time with students, as many of you in this room know, and there seems to be a, a tremendously different feeling coming through from students, which is how I gauge a few things at any rate uh, as to what's going on in the larger culture. There seems to be, once again, a real interest in finding out about women artists and in uh, networking with other women uh, and in uh, empowering one another with a sense of community with women. Um, and this seems to just be bubbling out of all the corners. I mean, I keep, I, I run into it on campus, I run into it out in the community, I find that the same thing's happening. Um, when I visit other cities in Connecticut besides Hartford, and it seems to be sort of just uh, emerging out of the woodwork um, quite possibly as a reaction to uh, the forthcoming end of the Reagan era, perhaps for other reasons, but I think it, uh, it meets those of us who have been in the feminist movement for a long time at a good point because the development of scholarship over the past uh, almost 20 years in 
feminist thinking is now at a point where we really have a tremendous body of information. I mean, we have done a lot of research, not just in women's art, but in feminism, sociological feminism, uh, literary feminism, all modes, political feminism, um, all modes of, of, um, of uh, uh, research itself. We have the information and we also have a whole variety, as you witnessed a bit of tonight, a whole variety of different methods for dealing with that information and are finding that different kinds of information are better suited to different kinds of methodologies. And all of that is available now. It's a tremendous wealth of possibilities available for um, an audience of women who are interested in pursuing that further. And it seems to work. I mean, there's now, there are enough different aspects of feminism possible that people who come interested in finding out more about what feminism is about can easily find ideas that fit their own state of mind, your own state of mind, at the time that you uh, join with the movement. So I see that as, I think that that's part of what's happening now to really in reinvigorate the feminist movement, and I see that as hopeful. <coughs> that's a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? question of the night. <laughs> Anybody care to answer? Uh, I don't want to sound too optimistic, <laughs> but um, the question has a kind of passive ring to it. Like, where is it going next? I am, I'm learning this, I'm, I'm, I'm observing and taking from what I see. Well, and I'm not learning, I'm watching, I'm learning, I'm taking. Right. But that's, that's, the, that's the whole point. It's like um, maybe there are things in what you are learning and seeing that start you going. That, I mean, maybe you can be one who helps to answer that question in what you do. You know, I mean, it's possible. It's, it's really possible for you to take, you and <laughs> like anybody else, to take some of those ideas and push them somewhere, to take them somewhere and not uh, just see what happens next. Uh, what happens next will happen next, but maybe you can be part of what happens next by having the chutzpah uh, to say, you know, I'd like, it, I'd like it to go this way, or I think this would be a good solution. What if I were to do that? <laughs> You'd have a lot of chutzpah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> You know, just, you know, your question, you know, the, and the, the easy answer is what goes around comes around. Um, but, um, you know, art is not something that, you know, a bunch of artists sit around and create a whole new style or create a whole new movement or create a whole new genre. It's a product of, you know, many, di it's, you know, like our lives, um, it's a product of a lot of different social forces. And so it's, you know, predicting what's going to happen to art is like, you know, predicting what's going to happen to the future. And, um, but there's no question that um, technology is having a huge influence on what people are creating right now. And um, mm -hmm. where is that, you know, where is that going to lead? You know, it's probably going to bring a crafts movement back into high art. You know, uh, who knows? Um, you're, you're making a comment reminded me of something which I think is important is that in the early 70s men often really seemed like the enemy and uh, you know a lot of people were in marriages who traditional marriages in which the women you know were 
help their husband through graduate school and type the thesis, I don't know how many dissertations I've looked at, which said, and finally, I want to thank my wife for typing my thesis. <laughs> and women got very angry, and there was a lot of anger, and May's works themselves, I think, really reflect a kind of transition from this uh, anger at patriarchy and anger at these kind of, um, you know, rednecks who were uh, sort of pro-war hawk and all that, and, and sort of moving out of that. Not that you've sort of given that up, but in fact, a great number of men have become feminists. You don't have to be a woman to be a feminist. A feminist is someone who, is, who thinks about power, the distribution of power, and the manipulation of power, and how women are often sort of get the short end of that. And all you have, that's like, the, to me, the basic definition. If you, you can be a man and think about those things, and you can be a feminist, and it doesn't mean that if you're a man, you're burning your bra. You know, and I think that we've moved into this this new era, and I've, a lot of the art reflects it. And I think even with the you know essentialism going back to sort of women's processes uh, of birthing, well, that is to sort of make women feel proud of themselves. But it seems to me that we haven't really seen male reactions to what it is to be a man psychologically. I mean, I think there's a lot of pictures out there and artwork out there waiting to be born, you know, by men sort of doing pictures of what it means to be a man and what it means to have a relationship to a father, father-son relationships. Women, I think, right now are in the forefront. They're leading into new areas of study. And, and men, I think, are picking up on that. You're beginning to see, I believe, men whose work begins to look like women's work, you know, because women are, are very exciting. It's like I begin to see white artists who do pictures that look like they've been done by black artists. And I think when we get to that point, it becomes very exciting. So there's a lot of art out there waiting to be born. <laughs> one, uh, author, one author who I was reading recently, and I unfortunately don't remember who it was, uh, classified or put another category on the essentialist deconstructionist opposition by saying that um, the essentialist approach is one of looking within and the postmodernist or deconstructionist approach is one of looking and analyzing from outside. And I wondered if maybe the panelists would like to comment on that uh, in relationship to your own work or your own writings. Um, I have trouble with 